and then I'm going to go down to my Snagit video. I'll be done ready in a second, and I'm going to record it from here as well. I'm going to try to at least. Except it closed the wrong area. So how oh, awesome. All right, so I've got that set up. I've got the right resolution. All right, let's let it rip. Record. All right, so um, this is Jeff Scott, and thanks for joining me tonight. All right. So what we're going to do today is sort of my Sunday review, and I'm going to do it real time. And today I thought, you know, little did I know when I planned this that this would probably be the turnaround night. Now, whether or not it closes that way remains to be seen. But what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about the market, what I think's going on, and then show you what I would do on a typical night to get ready for tomorrow. And since we have that special thing, which is – uh, potential market um, recovery tomorrow, I'm going to actually look at the possibility of current and all new, okay, of doing, um, showing how I do Ian's boxes and how I use them. So for those that don't know me, um, welcome. For those who know me, welcome. But I'm not here to sell you anything. I don't, I'm not an educator. I don't do, I don't, charge for anything except for one thing. I do one or two live meetings a year and I do 50 free webinars a year and other teaching. So I like to think that, well, if you've been to my live web, my live education events, you probably should realize that I lose money on them because I spend every penny because I'm not doing this to make money on you. Um, this is for educational purposes only. Anything I recommend is the spirit of education, not investment advice. I'm a doctor, not a broker. I'm truly independent. I spend a lot of time talking about HGSI. I don't work for HGSI. I don't get paid for HGSI, and I paid for my software just like you have. I happen to love the program, but I use a lot of other programs as well, and um, I'm going to open this up to Q&A, which is one of the benefits of doing a live meeting um, later on, and feel free to ask me about anything that I use. I'm happy to talk about it. And as proof of independence, I pay for everything I have. Trading involves risk. Union loan are responsible. I do like to call certain things out. Um, the first thing is that when I do education, and I think each of our own responsibility is to do what Ian taught me and taught many of you, I mean, you know, Pat and others, Agana and others on this board, I know from Ian's meetings, many of you, Bob Meager on this call, um, be your own guru. Don't rely on anybody, even the people I have here, to, to run your life and, and take care of your money. You have to do it. But the smart person, in my mind, gets educated. And you get educated by learning from other smart people. So I chose my smart people. Now, I've read a lot of books. Um, and I, I probably read a novel every three days. And I, I rotate between stocks, medical, or junk. Junk's fun stuff, fiction, um, usually World War II related mysteries. And so I've read a lot of things. Some things stick better than others. I started with Can Slim, as many of you have, um, O'Neill. He taught me the basics. Morales and Catcher, I got introduced to them through HGSI, actually. But um, they took what they learned working for O'Neill and I think made it better with their pocket pivots and Bible gap ups. I guess over the last couple of days, the short selling book was helpful too. Um, many of us have had the opportunity of spending time with Ian. What a wonderful person. Um, he, you know, we all miss him and I'm sure he's educating and teaching people up in heaven to be their own guru as well. But he really made it come alive. He took Canslim and partnered with George Roberts from highgrowstock.com. And they created a product that I think is still one of the best products in the market. It's certainly, for the price, the most comprehensive, does everything you can need product out there. There might be other products that do certain things better, but none of them do it all and as well and as, and as inexpensively as HGSI. Ron Brown, um, 
Ron's interesting character. Um, he was like many of us. He was in the audience and he got lucky. He got to become partners with Ian and they started Woodward and Brown investing. Now, Ron and I often trade the same stocks. Ron's really gone along with volume spread analysis as his secret weapon. And just to show you the beauty of HGSI, instead of having to pay $5,000 to somebody in England, um, it's included at the same price in HGSI. Van Tharp, king of money management, position sizing. It's worth reading the books. Um, George Lee is a friend of mine, great trader from the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think we're going to do something this year, a couple days in Vegas. Um, more to follow on that. Uh, have it, I've sort of committed, but I, don't, I think it's going to be a super small meeting with some of his friends um, and followers. Cigar over here from Superior Profit. He's new to, to many of you. I met him a couple years ago when I was surfing the web, trying to find if there's any software that I don't already own. And I found his and I actually liked it and started using it as a, as a regular. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I do with his. And then this guy here. Now, John is a character too. Um, he's a real trader. He uh, likes to talk about how he was riding the L in Chicago to Loyola for school. And he met some guy on the L who said, come work for me at the Board of Trade. It turned out to be um, the guy, George Lane, the guy that invented stochastics. So John, uh, while some of us were going off and getting grad school, in my case, going to med school, he got grad school teaching from one of the masters and worked his way up, ultimately owned options, um, brokerage, a trader, author. He's got some interesting indicators that I use. But what what John did for me is he really put it together by taught me not just what to buy, when to buy, kind of like I learned on the left-hand side, but really how to trade them. Now, I call my education, be your own guru. I'll probably show you these two slides twice, and it's the only thing that I talk about selling on this. I do the same meeting over and over and over again. I update 20 to 30% of my deck. Sometimes I add a new discussion. Um, and... It's really tries to recap what I learned from Ian, you know, the basics of how I trade, how we use a top-down approach, which we'll look at some tonight, how I use the tools to find my A trade, which is the type of trade that I like to take over and over again, how to manage money, you know, for many years of trying, sometimes good and bad word I come up with today, how I incorporated options, which I think actually lower my risk and increase my gains, what I call EPS roulette, um, how do I trade earnings. Last year we talked about Netflix and then how I put it all together. And then because I know that not everybody has the same historic background to what I talk about in the vocabulary, I always do some pre-seminar webinars and then some post-seminar webinars. So um, you'll see what else you get on the next slide. It's $500. Um, here's just a couple of comments. You can stop the tape if you play it back. But you know, I teach you real trades, and sometimes I'm, the trades make a little bit of money and pay for the trip, in some of these cases, for the next 100 years. Um, as I said, I don't do this to make money. I do this for, I enjoy it, and I enjoy the networking. Why do I charge if I don't do it for money? Because people usually value things by as much as they pay for it. And so my goal is to give you back many times more than what you paid. Part of that comes into your stomach. We always meet the night before. This program is on a Wednesday, so we'll meet on dinner on Tuesday Eve. Now, right now, I'm thinking of going out on my yacht, which I bought with the middle of the year's profits um, down here. Um, if not, we'll go to a local steakhouse. We, last year, we went to the Capitol Grill, which was great. Um, I'll feed you during the meeting. There'll be screencast videos that you'll get of all the presentations, PDFs, and then I'll share my personal indicators that I use for TOS, TradeStation, and TC2000 with the asterisk. I won't share things that somebody else is selling because that's, that's bad. Um, I only sell you know, the things that I pay to be developed for me that are not um, sold by somebody else. Um, looks like there's a couple of us that want to play golf, so I'm going to plan on golf on Tuesday before dinner. Um, and I believe there's a couple sets of clubs. You probably share clubs too. I've got two sets. Um, I'm on a great golf club. There'll be fees that apply outside the 500, obviously, for that. 
If you're interested, email me to hgsidoc at gmail.com and your spot's not secure until you send me PayPal to this email address, mdonk at mindspring.com or if you want to send snail mail, you just email me to hgsidoc at gmail and I will um, quickly respond with my address. Now, people ask, why am I doing the meeting on a Wednesday? Frankly, it's the right way to do it because we get to have trading during the day. Um, it's timely because John Person has a meeting Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, so many of you will stay over for that. And if you're just coming in and out for golf and trading or the boat, whatever, you're still home for the weekend. So it actually, I think, is a good day. So I hope to see some of you there. Now, those who've been watching the web know that I have a few things that I like to look at to give me a sense of when this market is going to um, bounce. Oh, still ro running that. And one of the things I look at is actually in Warden. And it is the T2121 indicator. And the T2121 indicator looks at the um, 13 week new high, new low ratio. So over the last 13 weeks, three months or so, the number of three month new highs versus new low occurring today, well in this case, this week. Now, if I spread this out a little bit, you would see that when I bottom, the market usually is bottomed. When I bottomed, the market's usually bottom, yellow being the um, S&P 500 here, the spiders. When I bottom, the market usually turns up. So I look for a bottom. Now, you know, sometimes you get all the way down to that magic line and it's perfect. Sometimes you don't. Um, perhaps it's got a lot to do with the depth of the correction. Well, this has been a pretty rapid and painful correction. Um, and we hit we closed at 0 0.87. Um, the low today was we got down to zero at one point. So at some point there were, let me double check that. Yeah, it got down below this. I don't know if it got to absolute zero. But the interesting thing is um, when I get down to this level over the last five years and before that, five years before that, um, this is when the market likes to reverse. It doesn't have to reverse. It can go a couple more days, but that's to me a reversal sign. Yesterday on the buckets, and we'll see what they were this evening, I had over 40% of the stocks in the S&P 1500 were below their lower Bollinger Band. Well, if they spend 90 92% of their life trading within the Bollinger Bands. And the student body left, 1400, you know, 40% have moved below their lower Bollinger Band. It's clear that odds favor that over the next few days, they're going to come back within their bands. And, you, and I, when I do my education, I actually went back and showed you over many years how that is a good rebound indicator. But as we saw in 2007, it can go on for many days before it hits. So I think this is a, another good sign. We'll see where we ended up today. And then this is another thing I wanted to show you. This is NASDAQ futures. And this was taken right at the market close. So right now, The NASDAQ futures are at 70.93. They've had a big move. We'll talk about why. At the time, they were at 70.43. But the reason why I took this picture was I like to talk about how I trade, and it, it, there have been comments that it's not as easy as I make it look. Make it easy. Why, if you had to pick one of these six charts that you would sleep at night if that was the instrument you were trading, which of the charts would you pick? I would pick either the middle on the bottom or the bottom right, because there's no whipsawing. In Abelsys, which is running on e-signal here, blue is when you're buying, green is neutral. 
And if you look at a weekly chart of the NASDAQ, going back to July of 2017, you still would be in the stock. You would not have been whipsawed out. Now, what we're dealing with right now may turn out to be just like the whipsaws we saw back here. Maybe it's worse. What about a monthly chart? I remember um, red, sell signal. And sometime in 2009, we went blue. We haven't come out of a buy signal on the monthly chart on the NASDAQ since 2009. We actually turned red on a bar um, back in here, but I actually commented to the Abelsys guy who was showing that bar off, something I learned from Ian who said, the bar doesn't count until it finishes. And lo and behold, we don't have any red bars there. Now, most of us are probably trading the daily chart. Nothing wrong with trading the daily chart. The daily chart here, also a nice long-term trend and clearly the NASDAQ broke. In fact, on the daily, the NASDAQ went into a sell signal. The other thing that I have on these charts are moving averages. And I use the three things that Ian used, the 17 in green, the 50 in blue, and the 200 in red on pretty much every chart I use. And if it's a white chart, I might have a yellow, sometimes I'll have a black instead of blue, but the green 17 and red 200 are always the same. And I notice on this daily, we pull back today, whoops, and, and landed right on that 200, which is another sign of a potential reversal. So let's take a look at the market. I'll show you the things that I'm thinking about, and we'll look at what the buckets are today eventually. So if I look at where the cash markets, and sometimes I think I confuse people because a lot of times my charts are futures, and the problem with futures or the advantage of futures is the patterns may actually look different because they're capturing all the activity in the market. So for example, if tomorrow opens up flat and trades down the rest of the day, you won't really capture on a on a um, index chart the uh, overnight action, which is already up quite a bit. So if you look at the, the, the major market indices, the S&P 500 here, the SPX, the NASDAQ in the middle, the Dow Jones upper right, the ETF for the Russell here, they all have met the Russell. For the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about how the Russell had led the market down and wondering a little bit of whether or not the rest of the market was gonna pull the Russell up or it was gonna happen the other way. Now look at it, they all look like the Russell. Everything is busted through their 200 day moving averages. Now that is bad. And that is something that uh, Able Sys, A-B-L-E-S-Y-S, -E -S, Pat. Um, the reason why, you know, you can look at these a couple of different ways is, you know, several times on the Dow, and if I go back far enough on the S&P, on the Russell, it stabbed through the 200-day moving average, shook out the market, and very quickly came back. So we may just be seeing an opportunity to buy. On the other hand, you've got to be concerned, and everybody's muted, let me try this again. On the other hand, you always have to be concerned that now that this 200-day moving average has been broken, so that's at 27.65, so that's 27, 37 handles away on the S&P 500. If it was it pull back into that S&P 200 and fail, so now we got to worry about this being resistance. But it's interesting to me that the Russell which was the aberration, now is the norm. The VIX, and we'll talk about it more, spiked, but it didn't get nearly as high as it did in February. And the dollar, which has run up since February, is actually now starting to moderate and give back some. So I always start looking at that. I like to jump into my uh, trade station stuff for a couple of different things. Now, one question that you might have is, you know, with the, the Hindenburg firing for a couple of weeks now, 
and everybody thinking that the market's in trouble, what was the smart money doing? So one of my favorite tools is the Commitment of Traders Report. And I'm going to show you what we're looking at in a second. And I have a lot more on this than you really need to see. But I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Many of us were trading back in 2009. And the market had come down hard. And then sometime around March 9th of 2009, we got a buy signal. John Person's PPS actually called it pretty spot on right here, but it wasn't that hard to see this. So this was 320 when he gave his buy signal. The point here was the market was coming down and sometime before the market bottomed, the smart money in blue started buying. And if I went further to the left, which would require me to add more data to this chart, which I'm not gonna do, you would find that the entire way down, the yellow bars were up, which meant the dumb money or the small investors, not that we're dumb, but we're considered the dumb money, were buying. So at the bottom, what happens? The smart money starts buying and the dumb money starts selling. So we're contrarian indicators. All along, you know, you got flip-flopping the smart money, you've got small pullbacks, and where are we sitting today on the NASDAQ? And then I'll tell you the problem with this data. The problem on this, the, 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 we're, we're sitting still very much the smart money, we're long. But they were long last Tuesday. The data is through Tuesday, released on Friday. So tomorrow we'll get data that will go through this past Tuesday. It'll be interesting to see if on the E-minis, and I think I did the NASDAQs, let's see. And on the NQs, the NASDAQ 100s, will we still find that the smart money is long? So I look at that on Fridays nights. I don't really look at it any other time except for my weekend reviews because it doesn't update until next Friday. And then, as many of you know, I am a big fan of John, and I typically go into the major market indices. I'll start here with the E-minis. And I look at six different points. I'm not going to go through all of them today. But I look first, am I in, am I in a John Person PPS buy or a sell signal? On the E-minis, we went to a PPS sell signal. So an automated signal told me on September 26, gave me a sell signal. And we really barely took out those highs before we rolled over. This is the weekly chart. It's in a sell signal. The long-term monthly chart's just been a rocket ship, still in a buy. That's the first thing I look at. So I got two sell signals, one buy. Second thing I look at is what's the color of my paint bar. If the, this is an Alexander Elder indicator, if the paint bar is red, he says the selling window's open. You could be shorting or you could be holding. If it's blue, the buying window's open. You could buy or hold, but you shouldn't be shorting. And if it's blue, it's a neutral signal. Well, I've got a red bar and a red bar and a blue bar. So that's two slanted towards the negative. The third thing I look for is evidence of MACD divergence, which are these red dots sitting on top, also an elder indicator. And his, his, he calls it the MACD divergence scanner. So why is that important and why is it not important? It can go on for days before it hits, but when you start to see these dots showing up, it's typically telling you that the market move is less dampening. And you could see I've got the dots precipitated the weekly sell-off. Those bearish. Fourth thing I'm gonna look at is how am I in or out of the bands? This is about as extended out of the envelope here, which is Elder's envelope, as I've ever seen. And just like with the Bollinger Bands, the tendency is to go back into that envelope. Now, I've seen plenty of times where we run up sort of next to the envelope, but when you get this far, that's a pretty rip-roaring buy signal. So that's the most bullish thing so far. This here is the high jump bar, and those who followed Woody knew that he came up with this years ago 
And the derivation that I use is I take the distance from the close to the 17, close to the 50, and the close to the 200. I add them up and I plot that number. And then I take what percent am I of the highest value in the last 200 days. When it gets to be like 100, so I bet if I go back to February, you're going to see a day where it's got, oh, there we go. Stop. Well, I'll go back. All right. So when I get, when I spike up at the top, like I did right here, and you should be able to, I should be able to bring some says, it was, a high jump was 100. Almost always that market's going to pull back. I don't care if it's stocks, an index group, things that are the most extended that they've been in over a year or in a year usually don't get more extended. Guess where we're at today? We're at the opposite. We're at my low jump bar. Um, I thought it was close to zero. It's one of these is at zero. Our high jump for, yeah, it was yesterday, is zero. Okay. We are at the most extended to the downside that we've been in 200 days. So even though this has been a much shorter pullback than we saw uh, back in February, March, this rapidity has made this more extended. So I see this, I get kind of interested. Well, what about my other indexes? I'm not going to go to that level, the NASDAQ, NQ100s. Actually, interesting, you know, this is today's bar. Not, I mean, tomorrow's bar, actually, not today's bar, because um, it's already trading their futures. But the NASDAQ at a very extended, and also, by the way, at a zero, I believe, on the high jump bar, um, had a spinning top. That could be setting up for a reversal. The Russell 2000, similar very ugly picture actually had a blue bar today and at one point was and I probably finished that way the least down of the markets and then lastly well it's a blue bar right now for tomorrow and then the Dow futures well ignore this big green this big bar here because this is tomorrow um, also with a high jump down by zero here's the futures right now uh, predicting that we're gonna see a nice pop at the open but it's not where they are today that matters, it's where they end up. Feel free to ask questions in the chat room. Somebody asked one already. So I'm seeing some stuff that's telling me I gotta be sharpening my pencils. Not sure I'm ready to jump in yet, but I gotta get start sharpening. So I'm curious what my buckets are today. So I wanna make sure I got S&P 1500. This is not a standard um, in Edge Raider as far as the symbol list. So if you have HGSI, all you really had to do was go in here and I got to update it to September or October now. I do it every quarter and I find my reference groups, uh, major index components, S&P 15, and then if I do a file, ask utility, export as a list, It'll go into Edge Raider and, and, and create a new list. Let's say we're going to call this list 10.12.2018. And I just, and I've set, selected symbol and name. So the next time I update Edge Raider, that will be finished. And then I'll kill the one that I'm going to use right now. And you can see it. Should be able to see it here. Although I may have, there it is. All right. So let's run the buckets while we're talking. Percent buckets report. HGSI templates. Hit run. Excel edge template. And let's let it do its thing. Now, next thing I typically do, and I'm doing this tonight with you, but if I wasn't with you, I'd be doing it with myself. Um, and that's not meant to be perverse. Um, is I do my quick review of the markets and the major indexes. And if I have this set up right, it's going to open up 24 things. And I go down to wherever your market analyst user group, something that Ron does for us. 
hit warehouse view. And it should open up over here. Everything's slow because of the number of things that I'm running in the background. Um, I would kill my trade station, which is part of the problem, but then I won't be able to show you what I want to show you. So it automatically goes to Major Markets Plus. There's my 24 items. Um, I want to rank it by raw combo, and I want to come in here and since, and I just want to rank these on price and value, volume, which is a top-down view. And what does it show me? Now, I, uh, Paul Reich put into um, the HGSI board about gold breaking out today. I actually bought some nugget um, before I saw that. But you can see that gold was the leader, volatility, the leader, bonds, a leader, silver, a leader. Um, not good if you're a stock investor. And small caps and mid caps and the NYSC, which is a little bit of everything, we're sitting here on the bottom. So you probably felt some more pain today, hopefully a lot less pain than you did yesterday, um, unless you were in all value stocks. All right, so two questions. Yes, I, I picked the one that says July because I've got to go into the one that says um, October and change it to 20 years and then download 20 years of stuff. I'll do that later. And there's maybe two stocks that are different. Um, you know, someone asked a very good question after a big whoosh down. Do you think about waiting for a short-term 4D EMA to cross above an eight-day EMA uh, or a different approach, more aggressive? I think um, that makes total sense. Um, I always like to put a buy stop at above the high of the bar, high of the day. That's another way potentially to get in. But yes, a four day crossing the eight day would be a very early way to get in. And you know, you don't want to find out that you go in big tomorrow and the market turns around and closes down. And that's so you want to find something that at least there's a reason for why you're doing something, not just picking five stocks because you think the because Jeffrey said the market's going up. And more importantly, Kramer said the market's time to buy tomorrow which spiked the futures. So I'll go in now and see, sit here in the middle is the S&P 500, 500. And I'm going to open that up. And again, things take a little longer when you've got open um, nine windows in Thinkorswim, trade station with five workspaces, and everything else I've got here. Uh, while we're waiting, you could see, you know, I don't want to touch it because I'll screw it up. Come on. All right. Yeah, when it goes white like that, that's it's a resource problem right now. All right, here's a chart. Good. You know, one of the things that is so awesome about HGSI, frankly, is the fact that um, it automatically goes to the instrument you picked. And um, I find that to be extremely useful. Let me get out of this view for now. Let me go in here. And let me check and see if this is, the, I did a change on this. Let me see if it's in this one. I added a bingo stock instead of bingo market to this view because I want to look at how many of these major indexes are firing a bingo. And if I leave it with the NYS, the way the bingo market said, it's tied to the NYSE. And so everything will be the same. And let me go back here. I got to make this a little lighter. I mean, this program, for, for what it costs, is so customizable, and, and it's the only one that has built in some of these indicators that we like. And I'm going to open up 
a new charity window as well and just call out uh, Chris Wilson, who gave many of us years ago a um, file of charts for the weekly charts, which have really become my go-to for shorting. And they also work in reverse in that they help me find things that are turning around as well. So we'll pull that up in a second. So I put these trend lines in last night. So we've been channeling. And in fact, if you watched my video on Sunday, I sort of took the, the bell-shaped curve of what I think the market does and I turned it on its angle because that's what we were doing. And, you know, I kind of anticipated that we would come down. In fact, um, this was Sunday's webinar and we were sitting on the 50 and we looked at, do we break out from here? All right, almost done. All right, let me go back to the S&P. come on. All right. Do we break out immediately, which was the high road scenario? The medium road scenario is pull back to the, to the trend line and bounce, or do we break all through and test the 200? Well, we tested and we failed it today. So we still got a ways to move. Now, what I mentioned earlier today or earlier on this call about breaking the, the major moving averages and them turning into resistance, it's a real phenomenon because now we have to be concerned. Are we going to go right back up here? I can't go further to the right, so excuse the. Or are we going to run up to that 200 and fail and go right back down? Those are very big deals. Or are we going to run up to the low bottom of the trend line, which will be a nice move and then come back down? So this is not clean cut. Every, all, everything's great, super bullish analysis. But we pulled down to the 200, and there's reason that says we're in a natural place to bounce. On the weekly chart, it's kind of interesting, and this is just a weekly of the S&P 500 with candlesticks, um, and maybe calling out that it's not that unusual to come down to this kind of a level, because we're really sitting at a, kind of an area that it's come down to before. Again, more reason to think perhaps we have a bounce tomorrow, which if you're bullish, you want one. So I'm trying not to be Jeffrey, Mr. Permabull. But that's the S&P. If I look at the Dow Jones Industrial, and I do this every night, but when I'm not talking, I can get it done in 10 minutes, including looking at the trade station and the think or swim slide. So if we look here at the Dow, and I don't have to go through all of them because it's the same story. For those that are new to HGSI, um, there used to be a term I'd hear on the radio it was such a bad day, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm sure I'm not the only person who's ever heard that. Well, guess what the bingo signal is, this gray bar. It's the bad day was so bad, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. To me, it's potentially a signal that the market is getting oversold and that we're getting closer, not necessarily immediate, that we're going to bounce. The interesting thing here is, how much stronger the Dow has been over than the S&P over the last couple of days. And you saw before the sell-off that it's uh, relative strength improved on a weekly basis compared to its moving average when it compared to the S&P 500. Um, going down the list of things, the NASDAQ. You know, similar thing with Trend lines break through. It's kind of like the water coming out of a faucet. Two days in a row of bingos, well below the 200-day moving average. Boy, this better bounce soon or we've got ourselves a big mess here. And then the Russell 2000 ETF basically led, it, led us here, but it looks like everything else. So the markets are in a world of hurt. Now, what would signal to me that it's time to get back into the market. Well, one might be, I'm just gonna take a chance based upon um, my overall feeling the markets go up. But if I wanted to be more um, analytic about it, 
I guess is a good word. I would be looking for signals. I would be looking for that Russell to perhaps pull back into the major moving averages. And I would be looking for things like kahunas and mobile breakouts from a squeeze. But we're pretty far down. I'm not going to see that. I would be looking for a Eureka, and that's kind of what I'm looking for right now. I just haven't seen one yet. Uh, I know there's been Eurekas. What's There's a Eureka. All right, November of 2016, the night of the election. Markets had sold off hard. Overnight, they dropped well below the 200-day moving average. And the next day, after the bingos, and after the, the Bozo won, I mean, Trump won, I'm not political, I actually liked him more then than I do now. Um, we had a Eureka, which is the HGSI version of a file through day, and we had kahunas come in. And up here we had a mobile breakout, and we had pocket pivots. So if you want to not just buy because you think it's so stretched it's going to bounce, and you want a more definitive reason when to get in, start looking for a Eureka, start looking for some kahunas and pocket pivots that are blue, not red, and maybe a mobile breakout to give you a signal. What's been strong, the dollar, main strong, although at a longer time frame, it was actually, had sold off, but we're in a nice run on the dollar. The dollar's sitting right above the 50. Um, had a weekday today, but um, perhaps just uh, not sure why. And then the VIX popped today, which we all know about, but it also came back down as well. So um, there is a signal out there, a trading system that talks about the VIX closes more than so much below the top of that bar that it, that, that VIX move is over and that the um, pullback is over. So that's another piece that might go um, along the lines of the um, market bouncing. All right, let me go see if my edge rater thing is done because once I run that, there you go, folks. We're getting to the point where that's a pretty significant move. After today, 96% of the stocks were below the midline of their Bollinger Band, and 57%, give or take, are below the lower band. That, is, you know, Kramer may said it's going to bounce, but I would watch, I'd pay more attention to that. Now, I'm curious, so I'm going to go over, and figure out which one, I don't want that picture, I want percent B. All right, I've got data points to 1998. So we've got 5,016 data points. Uh, I want to know, let's see if I can get this to happen. And I got to put it in, let's see. It's not built in, I have to put it into, um, into Excel. What I often do, and I don't know what I did there, so let's get rid of that, is I would, um, basically sort these, but I'm not sure it's not, I don't think it's letting me sort. I'd have to go into Excel um, and see how many days have we had higher than 98 in these 20 years of data. And I'm betting you we haven't had many days higher than 98% below the midline. Um, in fact, I bet we haven't had 10. And I'm also betting if I look and see how many stocks were um, below, hold on a second, the, the Bollinger Bands, that this is a pretty um, remarkable number. Now, if I step backwards, yesterday, a little bit over 40, 19, 17, 20, 16, and that's where it started to get bad. There was a 14, 12. So you can see that even though we've been in a mix of a tough market and lots of Hindenburgs, and we topped on the 25th. Um, 10 to 20 is kind of interesting, but it's more background noise. This is big. We are, this is big. 
So more ammo that says sharpen your pencil. So now I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, I'll know, I'll know how I'm really feeling at 929 tomorrow morning and more importantly at 4 p.m., but I'm feeling pretty good. Now I'm thinking that we just, I'm making this up as I go, but I'm thinking that we just hit a bottom on this market. And those that have been to my classes or Ian's classes know how much I like Ian's boxes. And Ian taught us that over decades, that after the market sells off, you buy the stocks in the, in, that are in the HGSI boxes with earnings and revenue growth rates, and those may out and often outperform the general market. And I will review that in more detail at the live meeting. So if I go up to all securities, and I'm going to put a filter. First, I'm going to, let me think what I'm doing here. I'm going to close. I'm going to rank this. I'm just going to put, doesn't matter what view I put on it for this purpose, but I'm going to put scorecard view. Well, before I do that, let me shut down, free up some, uh, don't like that. Free up some memories. All right. I was going to show you that. Let me get rid of this, free up some memory. All right. I want to put a filter on all securities. And that filter is going to say Ian Boxes. 255. And what that's going to do is it's going to only show me stocks that have an ERG of 255 or higher and have one of Ian's boxes attached to them. So go down here. I think I had a box one. Let's see. I don't want box one to heaven. Yeah, I'm thinking it doesn't matter which I put it in. All right. Now, every one of these stocks should have a box. And I have a feeling I took, I mean, all right. Let me do a couple things here. Go back to scorecard and look for my boxes. Here they are. So I got to fix my filter. I want to go. Erg 240 for boxes. Let me see this one. Let me, let me try this one. All right. Everybody has a box. I don't know why. Let me look at my filter real quick. Oh. Um, Ian Box is 255. Hit OK. Still, they don't all have boxes. Well, that's strange. Let me just look at this one more time and figure out why did I turn something off? It's always, yeah, it's always OK. And it's always an operator malfunction when it doesn't work. Trust me. HGS boxes greater than zero. All right. Hey, they all have boxes. So I've taken the 8,000 stocks in the market and I've ended up with 66 stocks. Now, let me find, um, I want to show you an old presentation, but I don't also don't want to um, mess this up any more than I already have. So, let's see if I'm lucky. I just want to show you the boxes real quick because what I'm showing you is worth doing. All right, 
So if I could speak English, I would tell you that Ian told us 20 years ago that he was sitting there and he came up with this thing right here of boxes, annual earnings. This is percent over the last five years. Across the top is current earnings last two quarters. And the box were defined by the intersection of the earnings percent growth rate and annual earnings. Numbered the boxes. If you're growing 100% per year and your multiple stays the same, you should double in one year. If you're growing 50%, you double in two. A box seven is a stock that stubbed its toes, so its annual earnings aren't great, but it's now humming and its current earnings are outstanding. He started applying this to stocks. He applied it. This was stocks from another way of looking at it. 1992-93, he looked at stocks in the boxes. You probably recognize some of their names. Many of them are out of, no longer with us. And what he found was, um, just look at the average return. And this is from September 11th to February 12th. Five months, 59%, 40, 17, 26, 55, 47. Great returns from a bottom of the market to its peak. All right, he got lucky. 98, 99, same thing, market bottoms. He looks at his boxes, 27 stocks out of 190. The average of 190 stocks between October 15th and January 22nd was 67% in three months. All right, how about more recent, 2011? Ran the report to determine the boxes, uh, da, 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 let me run this, on September, this, four, this was September 1st, 2010, seven months to April 29th, 2011, and you could see box one stocks in that period of time were up 125. Box seven stocks were up 106%. Um, the S&P was up 24%. I like this four to five times what the S&P does. All right. Um, same thing. Here is June of 23rd of 2013. Um, again, a list of stocks in the various boxes and looking at S&P was up 6.8% in this two-month period of time. And you can see that box four was up 31%. Box eight was up nine. Everything else was between nine and 31 compared to 6.8% for the market. Um, that tells me something. That tells me that I'd rather be buying box stocks. So all securities, Rank them whatever way you wanted to rank them. I chose the scoreboard combo because I want to um, make sure that I could see the boxes. I then created or made a filter that had two things in it. My erg choice of 255, boxes greater than zero. That means they have a box. Now here comes the piece de resistance. I click on the little pie thing when my computer is done having a conniption. I then go into this load custom slices. I find HGS boxes. And it's now told me as I, you know, how many stocks are within each box, 10 slices. And it's going to get really cool in a second. Now I'm going to hit make groups from slices. We're going to call this JAS October 11th bottom webinar. And hit OK, take a sip of my coffee. And now 
when it gets done, I am going, yeah, I've, if you email me, if you want, the, the, the presentation I'm going to post on the HDSI board and on YouTube again, because I'm sure you figured out I'm trying to drum up a few more people for my live meeting. Uh, for those that want to participate, and participation means the pre and post webinars and copies of everything that we do at the meeting. Um, I've taken, you know, DVD only. Um, for folks as well. So if I go down into my all securities, into my user groups, I better find one that says JAS October 11th bottom webinar. And here I have box one, two, three, four, five. And now I can start studying the various stocks based upon what box they're in to see if I can find something that looks attractive. The other thing that I can do, and by the way, there's some big winners in this list here, okay, is the reason why I want to keep TradeStation open, which may not work. Bastard. Excuse my French. I'm going to shut it down and restart it. I really am using up my resources on this machine while I'm doing this. So I apologize for the small technical issues. Um, I will stick this into a radar screen and um, that's how I'm going to, I'll follow these stocks and I'll probably create the radar screen tomorrow. And let me, so I do have a lot of windows open. So let me, um, I don't see anything else I want to close. Except for the, I'm going to try and show you what I'm talking about. I'll give it a couple seconds to come up. So the other thing that I would do tonight, uh, they switched servers at 855, so maybe that's why I got kicked out. That's interesting. The other thing that I would do tonight, and I do every night, is I'll go back up here, and now I'm going to go to 07 Industry Groups. I'm going to hit Warehouse View. That opens up 07 here. And now, I don't think I started it. Let's see. As you can see, I have one or two things open in this computer. All right. As you can see, I have... 174 industry groups, and I'm going to rank them by two days. <laughs> there was this market, it, here's just another piece of evidence of how oversold this market is right now. There is one group um, that was positive on the two-day force today. One Lousy group. Precious metals and mining changed index group. Um, we'll just take a look at these very quickly. The problem with this group is they're kind of like the VIX. Are they going up for fundamental reasons, such as gold is going up in price, it's more scarce, the dollar is weak, or is it a risk asset? Well, it's been going up since the beginning of September. It broke out today. This is American Barracks. Um, oh, good. It's got a couple of things I can show you. Um, been in a long-term downtrend. You can see the downtrend on the weekly. Um, broke above the 200-day moving average today, which is attractive. It had a pocket pivot yesterday in a kahuna. It broke above its PSAR dot yesterday, which I like to see as well. This is a mobile breakout. This is a Bible gap up. Notice my bongos are green. If you think I'm speaking gibberish, then you come to my live meeting or you sign up for the web-based version and you will learn my vocabulary and you'll learn that it's all blues and greens. Blues and greens are good, reds are bad. Lots of greens and blues. American Barracks looks great. Now, this is a secret weapon chart. If you don't have it, you come to the meeting, you'll have it when you leave. From Chris Wilson, um, 
And what Chris came up with is a couple of moving averages, weekly chart of candlesticks, a relative strength of the instrument versus the S&P 500. And when it breaks above the moving average is when it starts to improve the relative strength versus the market. So it broke above today. It broke above a major moving average. It's bongo turned green on the weekly. All it needed was a weekly kahuna to get me excited. This, is, this looks interesting. But again, if the market is, is just reacting and this is sort of running to a safe haven, it, remember it's in a downtrend. Newmont Mining, not up to the 200, but a mobile breakup from a squeeze. Pretty strong move off of the 50, clearly in a downtrend. Rand Gold, recently, I think there was an involved in an acquisition, is running up into resistance at its 200, but it's had two weekly kahunas, broke above its moving average. So are these going to be good plays or not? I, I have a feeling that it's not gold season yet, but maybe it's coming. I think it's, it's a place to put your money when the market's down 1,000 points in two days. Um, I bought Nugget today. And it's just, you know, high powered, the same thing. So Nugget was up. Its move is 20, was 20% today because it's a 3X. Similar story to the others. I'm not sure how long I'm going to hold it. Um, not that I'm, I hate gold. The problem I have with gold is gold has been dead money since the, since the election, basically. It's just gone sideways to down. Is it different now? Is now the time it's going to go up and be great again? Well, maybe. I like to get more of a signal than that. So that's interesting. That would have been a short bullish review. Um, what about the high jump on American Barrick? You know, it doesn't count. Why doesn't it account? Um, because it's... Uh, where am I going here? Um, it doesn't count because it's in a downtrend. And so basically, I don't think this program, remember, it's the sum of the price minus the 17 and minus the 50 and minus the 200. When it's not in a downtrend, I usually ignore it when it's not an uptrend rather. So it's in a downtrend. I'm not sure if it's meaningful. If my trade station came back on, I would check there. I look at it, you know, is it, has it had a too big move from 10 to 12 and a half? Um, maybe that's why it's doing that. Um, I'm not, I don't usually pay much attention in that scenario, but that was a great question. Thanks for asking it. And you may be right and I may be wrong. I just know what I do. Five day force up. That's 22 stocks. So that, uh, whoops, my bad. I want industry groups. Uh, can't be that bad. So in, in a two-day window, there's only one positive group. And in a five-day window, there's only one positive group. In a two-day down window, just to give you an idea of how bad today was, interestingly, there were no groups. Why? Because they're all in the five-day down. Let me make sure I didn't screw something up. 87 groups are in the five-day down. Now, in my mind, they should show up in the two-day down, but they never do. And I always – and I, I'm not sure why it would only show up in the seven because they're down on their two-day as well, as you could see here. Um, and infrastructure software, so groups like Fortinet, MindBody. Fortinet's been a great stock, but look at some of these stocks are down 12, 16. I know somebody was talking about Palo Alto Networks tonight. I mean, maybe I should be looking at these to see if some of them are going to be viable candidates. Well, it had a little green bar today. Um, you know, maybe. I think the comment earlier, perhaps, of putting a, a four and eight day EMA and looking for a cross before you get in, that may make sense. But, you know, this has been a leader. If the market's going back up, which is a very big two letter word, um, buying leaders after they've been beat 
in a continuously uptrending market is a great way to make money. Um, railways, 13 to 15% down um, in the last five years. So if the market does turn around, all these stocks that are ugly are going to do great, at least in my historical experience. The issue is going to be, is the market going to really bounce tomorrow or is it going to be sustainable? Of course, I've now got my curiosity and, you know, we still are sitting there close to 100 points at 9 o'clock above fair value, which not a big shocker. So I would typically go through a bunch of these, but, you know, I'm not looking for stocks to short where we are right now. The time to short was on September 25th, um, not now. Um, I, now I'll be looking for these things to bounce. So what else might I do? Let me show you Trade Station. I want to get it back up for a reason. And then I'm continuing to watch your questions. And if you have any additional questions, I'd be more than um, happy to attempt to answer them. I got a feeling I got a problem, so let me go see here. One of the things that TradeStation does for me is it leaves things behind. And when it leaves things behind, sometimes it's hard for me to get another version to get up and running. So, all right, come on. You can do it. You can do it. All right. It's funny. I use this computer to trade all the time when I'm on the road, but I don't usually have a Zoom, a Snagit video, and all these programs open. Come on. All right. So is my quotes on? Nope. How about my warehouse view? Yep. Yeah. The Japanese bought Trade Station. Unfortunately, I'm stuck with it because I have paid a lot of money for indicators from John Person and others, oh, don't do that to me, that are basically tied to me owning TradeStation. And if I get rid of TradeStation, I'm going to have all these indicators that I paid for that I can't do anything with. So I will continue to have TradeStation but I'm finding it to, it's not the most stable platform as you can see here, but I may not be able to get it up. What I wanted to show you was my radar screen. And my radar screen is a tool where I've put a number of indicators and I could watch them during the day. The closest thing to do that in, in Thinkorswim, all right, oh man, I'm sorry. I'm. You know, I'm probably the most frustrated person on this call because of, op, of, of computer malfunction. Then you can see my trade stations. I think our swim's not happy because of resources either. I'll give it a second to see if I can fix it. If not, we'll say goodnight in my next webinar. I'll go deeper into, all right, tra radar screen. But radar screen is a tool that allows me to um, – put all these stocks on my screens and watch them during the day and look for specific signals. All right, I give up. I'm not going to do that. My apologies. Let's see. If it, no, I don't want to do that. Hold on one sec. Let me see if I stop sharing. I'm not going anywhere. You're just not going to see anything for a second. see if, it, if I can clear it without. Yeah, that actually just, that's interesting. That just freed up my resources a lot. So let me make sure I killed it all. Huh. You should see how smooth it is now with me when I did that. Let's see if this will start up. Oh, a trade station starting. All right, we're in business. All right, I'll be back with you in a second. 
I hope I didn't lose you guys. I've got a feeling that I may have done that. All right. I guess I haven't lost you. Share screen. Desktop one. Share screen. Now I got to put everything back up that I took down. My chat window. Good. All right. Glad you're still there. It looked like I lost you, but I didn't. So that's awesome. And it looks like a lot of you are still here. That's awesome too. So I'm going to open up a couple windows here to show you what, why you should have TradeStation despite my complaining. Screener, scanner. Oh, this is going to, all right, we'll open this up. This is really, let's see if it doesn't kill everything. All right, I'm opening up the three windows that I use most often, and I'm going to show you how I'm, what I'm going to do with those buckets, those boxes. Any questions while I'm waiting? Is the chart that shows Smart Money in blue part of the TradeStation software package that were provided in the meeting in Florida? Um, that is that. So the, the commitment of traders report is a free report that John Person gives off of his website. I believe you can reproduce some of the chart with standard um, trade station indicators, but it's part of John Person's VIP package. So since he sells a package where he's done value added to it, um, that would uh, um, not be something I'm going to give away. Um, what do I think about the HGSI daily screen of their top 100? Um, in some ways, I love it. Um, in some ways, it's too late. What do I mean by that? In the designer, the other problem with, with TradeStation, it takes a little time for it to boot because I got so much stuff. In the designer, um, under custom groups, there's one called the HGSI top 50. And what that top 50 does is it takes all of, I mean, I mean more, I got more explanation. The top 50 goes through all these smart groups. A smart group, and you notice there's, a, there's names there. These are the people that created them. So we'll look at myself. Three times big uptrend in volume. To me, stocks that have a big volume day, I want to pay attention to. All right, so what the program does is I could do this thing called a group inclusion report and say, I have all these groups that I follow, and let me check off all these groups, and I'm just going to check mine off, and all I want to know is, are there any stocks, let me take off the bearish one, uh, red candle highs bearish and a breakdown, are there any stocks that are found in a high number of my <coughs> groups? So I'm going to hit OK, and it's going to probably ask me to put a name on there. So we'll call it a test. And it's going to look at each of those groups, and it's going to tell me that Murphy Oil made it to five of my groups. Green Plains Inc. Biofuels made it to four, and Pre-TM Research Resources made it to four. So the idea is if these groups are, um, hold on one second. <coughs> it tells me that these stocks were the ones that showed up in my bullish groups. Now it turns out, now, there's lots of folks on this that have groups, including a bunch of Ron Brown and Ian's groups, Gallardi's groups, Gil Morales' groups. Wouldn't it be nice if it was automated for you <coughs> that you could just run your update and you would find a list of the 50 stocks that were most commonly found in the positive groups? So here we have the most recent top 50, and let's just take a look at 
I'm not going to look at all of them by any means. I got to take off this filter. It should have gone off anyways. All right. So here's 47. I just got it filter there for price and volume. Let me just take the filter off. And I could have started looking at these stocks if I was doing a bottoms up. And one thing I like to do is to take that top 50 and see a bunch of miners, specialty pharma, some biofuels. Notice there's only one biotech. There's no big pharma. That's kind of interesting. A couple specialty pharma. Um, and I might look at these if I didn't have a lot of time. Um, and I use this and others use it as a tool to find market leaders. When I do my weekend review, I include, I, I take all way beyond that. Um, I look at a lot of different groups and I basically cut and paste from lots of resources, including um, the top 50 and I look at them. I think it's a great list. Can I use it on ETFs? Yeah, but that's not how it's set up in this program. Um, if you decided that you wanted to trade ETFs and you built your own screens for ETFs and you wanted to find which ETFs made it to the most of the daily screens, you could certainly do that as well, but you do it manually like I started. So here's why you want to buy. buy. You get it for free, TradeStation. Number one, the scanner. The scanner allows me to combine all my worlds. I have my John Person studies. I got my cigar studies. I've got some Van Arps and Elder studies. I've reproduced my HGSI scans. And then I can get down here and I can start combining them all together. And I use this to run scans to find stocks that I might want to look at in more detail. All right. Um, the other thing that I use it for is John's best thing that he has is this high closed doji not the best one of his best things that he created and i every friday this is my list to fish from weekly high closed dojis and then i look for them occurring near support with rising volume or on balance volume and so i use these to build and those stocks go right into my watch list too that i then manually look at so it's a way of scanning large numbers of stock after the market to find signals. That's scanner. This is radar screen and it takes a while for it to load up. So we're not, I'm not going to necessarily wait for that to happen. So radar screen, basically I could put in whatever stocks I want to put. And then I have across the top, I have different signals. And then real time during the day, it's going to be scanning for the signals I want, including Bible gap ups. Now, I don't know if I got this thing that just won't go away. Go away. There it goes. All right. Oh, it's me. Okay. And it's got, I can scan for Bible gap ups, pocket pivots. And this occurs all day long while I'm trading. So what I will do now is I will build a new workspace that will have the boxes and I'll be looking to see the boxes breaking out because that'll tell me when it's time to go in the market. Thinkorswim does have Market Watch. Market Watch has some really good things. One thing that's really good about Market Watch is it's free. What's really bad about Market Watch is that in my TradeStation radar screen, I can have a thousand instruments. Here I can have a thousand or less boxes. I can usually get no more than 200 before the system gets, you know, starts giving me error messages. But the whole point is, if you have your favorite signals, can you build them in and see kahunas, high closed dojis, pocket pivots, Bible gap ups? Yes, most of these, but not the high closed dojis, will come to you for free at my meeting. Am I going to post how to do box stocks? Probably not out in the public domain. It's one of the things I like to talk about at my live meetings. Um, any other questions? Thanks for the comment about my yacht. It's incredible. <laughs> my wife hates it. Just makes another part of my life that I'll be doing without her. 
but she's a great girl, so I'm not complaining. She doesn't like fishing either. Other than that, we're good. Any other questions from anybody? All right, so you'll excuse the shameless plug because there'll be people coming to watch that don't know me because uh, I'm going to post it. Just reminding everybody, my Only Palm Beach event will be November 28th. $500, I promise you'll get your money's worth and beyond. And um, those that don't want to come that would rather just purchase it and get the videos and the presentations, um, I'd be more than happy for you to do that as well. Um, and um, we'll look forward to hearing from you. And again, if you're interested, drop me a quick note at hgsidoc at gmail.com because it's going to fill up but you don't count until you PayPal me to the MDonk at mindspring.com. This is an 80 foot azimuth. Um, it's a few years old, but I learned already don't buy new boats. They get scratches like old boats and then they're worth a lot less money than you paid for them. Um, Gary, last year I did the seminar by webcast. Um, if I have enough people who are not attending that want to pay, um, I can see if I can get it done again. Right now I'm planning on shipping to you via the internet a Dropbox within 24 hours that will have all the videos and PowerPoints so you'll capture as much as you can. I did live stream it last year. It sort of killed the internet for the rest of us in the room. So I'm looking at alternatives on that. Any other great questions? All right. Yeah, the box stocks is cool. It really is a cool thing. So I'm just curious before we say goodbye where the futures are, and I suspect they're still doing good. But I, I, I just want to now temper all of my enthusiasm. Well, they tempered it for me. No, that's 106 p.m. That's not current. Hold on a second. <laughs> That was a bummer. All right. We're still up about 100 on the NASDAQ after fair value, 266 on the Dow. I have been here before. And, you know, what you don't want to see and what I don't want to see is the market to trade up, okay? And here's 930. And then we come into the market and we're buying, 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 buying. And then at 1030, that happens. So just because Kramer said the market's going to bounce doesn't mean it's going to close up. Just because I say it's going to bounce, it doesn't mean it's going to close up because that'll give you a candle that looks like that, or sorry about that. It'll be a red candle that opened here and closed down here, and that's going to be a painful day. So, what do I think's going to happen tomorrow? I think it's going to. That's what I think's going to happen. I think the market is going to hopefully withstand China and Europe overnight will probably give up some of its gains by the morning and trade up tomorrow. Uh, one of the things that I thought was um, encouraging was when I looked earlier, and you can look for your favorite stocks on your own, but Amazon, which has been hammered, was up after hours, um, $33. Um, that's Pretty, that's as, almost as much as it lost today. That would be a big move, an opposite but equal move. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting today too is Netflix. And this is where the after hours and pre-market will kill you. It was down 20 bucks at 8 a.m. today. And it ended up ending up, let me go back here. So it was down 20 bucks this morning and ended up closing down five bucks. And it's up $7 after hours. So Right now, the markets look strong. Just be careful. Um, and that's right, how many people want to go home long for the weekend? So 
everything looks like tomorrow is going to be a positive day. It's how it closes, not how it opens. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see some of you in Florida. I enjoyed doing these. I appreciate it. I like doing interactive, so that was great. And you all have a great night, and I'll, I'll post recordings before I go to bed. Goodbye, everybody.